Willkommen in einem anderen Aufregens Video. Oh, welcome to another exciting video. This is part 38 of my Game System History and Theory series of videos. In this case, rather unusual video, I'm covering the SPI series of quad and folio and polyonic board games and a figure gaming version of that particular game system. This is a rather strange figure gaming review as I'll be initially reviewing the game system which was designed as a board game. In order to review the figure gaming version of this game system, I need to really cover where its origins were and what minimal changes were required in order to make it possible to play with figures. Let's start with the board game review. SBI published Napoleon at Waterloo in 1971, which used a game system based on a Civil War board game. This game system was then used for a number of other Napoleonic battles, totaling 14 board games in all. The game system was very successful and was easy to learn and play, but required skill to master, which is about really the ideal outcome for any set of rules. These rules were often used in board gaming competitions, and while the victory conditions were often a major issue, local competition modification to the victory conditions quickly resolved any of these issues, and they proved very, very popular for competitions. I even saw a, a game of Marengo being played several years ago in a board game competition, even though that game had been out of print for what must have been at least 40 years. Napoleon at Waterloo, which was published in 1971, was the first of the Napoleonic battles covered using this game system. This is one of the only two games I have not converted into a figure gaming con uh, scenario, mainly because SPI came out with this battle in a latter game, which I think was a better game to do the conversion from. The Waterloo game was rather successful, so SPI published a, another battle using the same game system called Borodino in 1972. Finally, in 1973, again the following year, a third game was published, Auschwitz. Because SPI came out with another game covering this battle, I also did not convert this particular map or set of pieces into a board gaming format. Now this was the end of the first three games using this particular game system in this particular format. After a gap of a few years, in 1975, SPI published its Napoleon at War Quadra Games, which in this case covered the battles of Marengo, Jena Olstedatz, Wagram and Leipzig. In the following year, 1976, SPI published its Napoleonic's Last Battles Quadra Games. In this case, the battles covered were Ligny, Quatre Bar, Wavre and Waterloo. And in this case also, which was a bit unusual compared to all the other games, you could join all these four maps together to create the entire campaign and, in theory, uh, battle it out at a much higher scale. Again, after another few years a gap, SBI published its Napoleon Art of War pair of games in an s and magazine, in this particular case covering the battles of Eylau and Dresden. Finally, in 1980, SPI published their last game using this game system, in this case the Battle of Auschwitz. This totaled 14 board, game, board games. The basic game system remained pretty much the same, but a lot of development occurred in terms of adding more accuracy and details, particularly in the exclusive rules, additional rules, optional rules, etc. We'll be discussing some of these additional optional rules or enhancements that SPI implemented over the period of years that they uh, basically came out with games using this game system. While I'll be covering the SPI board games quite a bit, the video is primarily about the conversion of this game system in a figure gaming format. Now this can be done by any player themselves using the original SPI rules. Or they can download my attempt at this. Version 1 of my attempt is a straight conversion of the board game into a figure gaming format with minimal number of modifications to allow it to be figure gamed. It will be using, for the most part, a playing area which is pretty identical to the original map. Now, this particular game system is, or this set of figure gaming rules, for want of a better word, um, any kind of comments that I would make against this or about this is really identical to the board game, as both actually play extraordinarily similar. 
Now, it's simple to learn, simple to play, and does take some skill to master. It's totally focused on reproducing historical battles, and the special rules for each battle need to be consulted to ensure you get a historical result. The only issue is the playing area needs to be very accurate, which can be a bit of an issue if you're trying to recreate a playing area. I both have made custom-made playing areas, which duplicate the original SPI board gaming maps pretty closely, or I use a standard playing area and use felt to represent uh, various terrain features to try and get it as close to the original map as possible. Now, the formal format looks good because I'm custom making the playing area, but takes a lot of effort and, of course, can only be used to play that particular battle. The latter is much simpler and easier to set up, but does lack bling. Now, the only issue is that uh, <clears throat> in the original board game, you know, <clears throat> a small distance difference can have a major play balance effect. And you have to really make a big effort to ensure the playing area is actually very accurate and the initial deployments are correct. Now version 2 of this is a fully rewritten version of version 1, specifically designed to be solely a figure gaming set of rules. Now this is not required to refight the historical battles from the original SPI rules, which can be done using version 1 but is designed to give figure gamers more of what they would typically expect, such as morale, rules, command control, and a host of figure gaming concepts which are absent from the board game. These are all really designed to add bling. So far, I tend to use the standard rules and bypass the bling, but I'm certain some players would want the French guard to have that extra bit of punch, or, for example, Prussian Landwehr to have some disadvantage against regular troops, and also for cavalry to be a little bit more unique than in the board game. Now the biggest advantage of this version is that I can use a standard playing area and play a points based game so I don't have the playing area issue that I have with the original um, and it becomes a lot more like possibly a traditional figure gaming set of rules. Well, now that we've got the uh, basic introduction over with, let's uh, drill down into the actual game system. Normally what I do now is go through the basic, basic game system points that I'll be covering in the review, but because this is a rather unusual review, I'll just give that a skip. Let's go straight into the game system analysis without any delays. Let's start with game scale. In terms of game scale, we can reproduce Marengo or Leipzig with no more than 100 units total on a similar sized playing area. The scale is flexible, so for Marengo the scale is about 200 meters per hex, and while for Leipzig it's close to 800 meters per hex. Marengo uses one hour game turns, while Leipzig uses two hour game turns. The strength point scale also varies accordingly. The rules are designed to refight an entire battle over a very wide range of force and battlefield sizes. If we look at my version 1 of the conversion, which actually any player can do themselves, the figure gaming rules simply uses the same scales as the board game. Version 2 attempts to fix it at about 500 men per figure and a ground scale of 1 in 10,000 with a 90 minute game terms, but does allow for some variability here and there. But for version 1, the scale range varies as much as the actual board game, allowing people to basically play an entire battle, irrespective of how big or small the battle was, with a similar size playing area and actually a similar number of elements or bases. For the figure gaming version, I fixed the standard playing area at 3x4 feet in size, with an optional 6x8 feet playing area used using a different scale for players who like monster games. Actually, the closest duplication of the board game does require a 6 by 8 foot playing area, but I find generally this is a little bit too large for um, the area I you know, wish to play in. So I've actually halved everything to 3 by 4 Players can do whatever they so desire. Because the games are reproducing historical battles, the game turn scale is rather specific to the battle. So as a result, the game, number of game turns do vary based on the season and location. This can range from one to two hours per game turn. The figure gaming version uses um, 
that is version 1, uses the same game turn scale as the board game, but version 2 uses a standard game turn scale of 90 minutes. If you want to reproduce one of the SPI uh, battles, then version 1, which is the closest match to the original board game, is probably what you'd go for, and the game turn scale really depends on the battle. Now in terms of terrain setup, as you can imagine, there are no terrain setup rules. The terrain is fixed and players basically play on a custom playing area or map. For the figure game version, this also applies, which is really the biggest problem of uh, converting or playing these games in a figure gaming environment. You've got to actually make the playing area, and that can be a lot more difficult than you may initially think. As this game system was not designed for figure gaming ad hoc battles, um, you know, you can understand why there is no terrain setup. Although to compensate, there is a large number of historical battlefields which can be chosen. So there's no lack of terrain or battleship, battlefields that players can use. When we come down to the um, sequence of play, it's a classically simple I go, you go sequential system, which each, with each player conducting a movement phase, followed by a combat phase. There are no command rules in the board game. Some of the games, such as Eilau, have individual core demoralization rules, but apart from this, there are no commanders, no command control, and no command quality rules, apart from some special rules for each battle, such as Napoleon getting a special counterattack bonus in the second half of Marengo, etc. Now, uh, I have added command radius rules in the figure game version as an optional rule. To avoid, this is really designed to avoid a game system issue with the original board game. It's not a major issue, and if players you know, want to not use that, then it certainly will still play exactly like the board game. But figure gamers may find some of the things a bit odd, because individual units can fly all over the place, sort of like a space battleship, a uh, space battle where... There's no concept of, you know, how close you are to your player area and command control and things of that nature. Now, if players want special quality rules for commanders, they probably would not need to add it themselves. Now, some of the battles do contain demoralization rules, which can affect the entire army. This is mainly used to simulate army routes or in the game, and in principle, these rules are reasonably good. If Marengo possessed demoralization rules, then the Austrians could find themselves affected by this when Napoleon counterattacked instead of using a special rule which attempts to reproduce this and which actually causes other play balance issues down the track. Unfortunately, due to the game mechanics, the demoralization rules as they stand don't really work very well. Demoralization is affected by retreats, which can actually be difficult to track. You simply forget to track it. A better system would be one solely based on losses, which are very easy to track because you can see the losses, and probably objectives, which are also easy to track because you can see who actually controls whichever objective. But anyway, this is a personal opinion I have only. As for orders, there are no orders, which really is excellent. This makes the game significantly more playable. It should be noted the core reasons that rules include orders is to force players to move an attack or to force players to not move an attack. At this scale and using the game system um, and using this game system, the former is not really an issue. Uh, players very quickly learn that they need to attack to win. Although the latter could be an issue, of course, the issue is that, uh, you know, you can always do everything at all times, which may not be that historical. Some of the quadra game rules have the concept of activation, which is a pseudo orders rule. Units cannot move until activated or in another way or describing another way, orders given to allow them to attack. This, wa this was inserted as a special rule to overcome a game balance issue in one of the games and is possibly some form of activa and possibly this kind of activation rule could be included in the standard rules. However, SPI came to the conclusion that the vast bulk of the game simply didn't need it. It was only a couple of games where you had situations where commanders did nothing. And so rather than weigh down uh, the, the core rules with these rules, uh, this was basically a optional or exclusive rule added for the scenario, which is actually an interesting idea. It um, is, is something that I thought about quite a bit and is one of the reasons why 
particularly for my version 2, the standard game is virtually identical to the board game. It has no bling in any way, shape or form. You can add it as you so desire. And basically my intention is for different scenarios, there's a recommended, you know, for this scenario, we recommend you use the moralization rule or we use this rule or whatever. And that way we don't load down players with lots of rules um, that they basically don't need for most of the game. And they only need to learn them when they need to learn them. As for reaction tests, what reaction tests? There is no reaction testing, which also helps to make the game system playable. Some battles do use demoralization to fill this gap, but this affects the entire army. The issue with not having reaction tests is the combat results need to include the effect of what the reaction tests normally duplicate, such as breaking and routing. In this case, the game system actually does this extremely well, so there's just simply no need for reaction tests, particularly at a unit level. As for unit quality considerations, uh, there is no unit quality. Although it's possible the rules use a variable scaling for troops of different quality, that is, you know, guards, they may use a scale of five, you know, let's say 200 men per strength points, and for low quality truth, maybe 400 men per strength points. However, it's pretty hard to actually pin that down. Now, it would not take much effort to include the concept of troop quality, such as, you know, let's make guards worth two strength points when attacking and one when defending, or something along those lines. I, had it, I have added this uh, as a, you know, this is an option in my version 2 rules. I actually rarely use it, but, you know, some players may wish to do so. Now we come to troop states, you know, such as disorder, steady, shaken, and so on. The rules do not actually cover any of these states. Now, this is good for simplicity in gameplay, but may cause issues with long drawn out conflicts using, let's say, a smaller game turn scale, such as Marengo. And it is, does cause problem at Marengo. Generally, however, I don't think this causes any real issues uh, with any of the other battles because the scale is high enough and also the nature of the game system. Troop states are normally used when the combat takes more than one game turn. In this game system, and at this scale, this is almost certainly not an issue unless you start uh, going down to one-hour game turns or if you want to try and jury-rig it yourself to, let's say, 30-minute game turns, in which case troop states become an issue. Saying that, uh, the demoralization rule does give players a kind of uh, army unit state level. One note, because each unit contains up to four elements, you can actually have the concept of step losses, which the board game lacked. I have changed the CRT to allow for ongoing losses, which is an easy way of depicting troop states. That is, you know, if your unit is involved in a long drawn out battle, uh, this would be reflected by it basically using elements over the length of the game. Now, the uh, movement rules within the rules um, are fairly simple, and it really only varies by some basic troop types, with light infantry and light cavalry having an extra movement point compared to non-light cavalry or light infantry. Now, they don't actually call it light cavalry or light infantry, but you'll see some of the cavalry has a movement of seven. That's the second number. So a Kellerman's uh, unit is two seven and some have a movement of 6, uh, such as the river uh, unit, which is 2-6. I have to assume the 7 is light and the 6 is non-light. And the same occurs with infantry. You'll notice some of the infantry has a movement of 5 rather than 4. Now, the uh, artillery also has a slight difference. Uh, the horse artillery have a greater movement rate than the non-horse artillery. And that's pretty much um, what... It, what it is. Now, in Marengo, and only in Marengo, uh, the French have a greater movement rate than the Austrians, and I think that was designed to overcome play balance and um, is not really needed in any other games. Now, in the figure gaming version, the movement allowance that you see here, rather than allowing you to, let's say, cover one hex per movement point, would allow you to cover one base width for the expenditure of one movement point. Now, I've done this because uh, in my conversion, I have gone for the hexless figure gaming game system, using a base width as the side of a pseudo hex. I 
you know, personal preference. I simply don't like having hexes in a figure gaming uh, environment. I think um, the purpose of figure gaming is bling. And as soon as you start cluttering up the playing area with counters or hexes or anything that shouldn't really be on there in reality, you detract from the bling. Other players may completely disagree with me. And if they do, when they do their conversion, they can use hexes and basically duplicate the entire board game exactly in the way that um, the board game was designed. That's entirely up to them. Now, the only other comment about movement point is the... Um, cost to travel through or over some types of terrain will cost additional movement points. Normally uh, you expend, let's say, two movement points to travel in a particular type of hex rather than one movement point, or you spend an additional one or two movement points in order to cross a hex edge. Now in the figure gaming version, if a terrain costs two MPs to enter, a unit simply covers one centimetre for each two centimetres of movement allowance. Crossing linear terrain is executed in the same manner as the board game rules. So the movement rules transform or translate directly into the figure gaming with pretty minimal modifications. Now the combat system uses a rather simple odds calculation and a D6 spun on a CRT to get a result. Each unit has a combat strength with all the attacking units totaling their combined combat strength together and comparing the result as an odds against the defender's combat strength. The possible result, and of course, then they spin a dice and cross-reference the result to get a result. Now, the possible results are very simple, with most combats resulting in a defender or attacker retreating. There is an exchange where the defender is eliminated and the attacker must lose an equal number of strength points or more. Finally, we have a simple defenders or attackers eliminated, which is fairly simple to understand. The CRT, in the most part, is what's called a lossless CRT. It's difficult to achieve off odds of 4 to 1 or greater, or, although you can be forced into low odds combat, but for the most part there are few casualties as a result of combat occurring during the game. There is a reason for this, which I'll cover in the zone of control sections, but as we can see now, we have step losses in units. So as a result, the CRT can be tweaked. Incidentally, the reason why SPI has a lossless system is there are no strength points in their board game. You know, if you have too many losses, then um, you can basically end up with a game which is really influenced purely by luck. So by having a lossless system, they eliminate or reduce the effect of luck. I mean, that's the reason why they do it. We don't have that issue in the figure gaming version because we do have steps. Now, for the figure gaming version, I've made a slight change to the CRT, mainly because of the use of one four elements per unit gives you the opportunity of having steps, which allows you to start showing the effect of long drawn out combat on a unit. There is a slight increase of casualties with A1 or with A2 and D2s, which do not exist in the original CRT, but in all other cases the players can take a loss instead of retreating. Personally, I feel the CRT should have a loss for both sides as well as a result built into it, as later SPI games adopted. But this works and players can use this system or the original CRT, it really doesn't matter, and they both work and they both give you a game. Now for the most part, all combat occurs between adjacent units. There is no difference between fire combat and close combat and both occur to get, you know, together within each combat phase. However, there is a special type of ranged fire combat called bombardments, which only artillery can perform. Artillery can attack from two hexes away, supporting the attack of other units. This gives the attacker the ability to project firepower into a single spot to break through. In the most part, bombardments is used to dislodge an enemy defender in good terrain. But this is rather, um, and in this it's quite effective. In the figure gaming version, it's really simple. Basically, uh, each hex is a base width, so each artillery unit can bombard things from two base widths away and we add another half because as you'll soon see I use the concept of the moving zone control which is half the base width so basically if the bases are four centimeters wide artillery can basically bombard enemy units um, up to 10 centimeters away supporting other attacks they can of course also be involved in attacks as per any other normal unit which is not bombardment
Now so far we're dealing with a really simple and basic game system, especially when compared with most figure gaming rules. The question that you may be asking yourself is where does the skill come into something like this? To understand this, you need to understand how zones of control work. Zones of controls are not common in the world of figure gaming, but are very common in the world of board gaming. There are many types of zone of, zone of control rules, but the SPI Napoleonic Folio games use locked zone of controls, which means once you've entered a zone of control, you cannot leave it except as a result of combat, coupled with compulsory combat in zones of control, or mandatory combat, which means all units in an enemy zone of control must attack, and all enemy units in a friendly zone of control must be attacked. It's this rules, or these rules, which require skill. While these simple additional rules don't seem to possibly have much impact, they suddenly make combat far more complex, as now two lines that are in contact um, require you to decide how you want to actually attack, as we'll see in a moment. Now, the other significant point is if a unit is forced to retreat, and remember the bulk of results are retreat results, you cannot retreat into an enemy zone of control. Uh, if you are forced to, you're eliminated. Thus, it's possible to win a combat, advance after combat, and end up surrounding an enemy unit, which is, if forced to retreat, is then eliminated. So while the CRT may be lossless, you can inflict significant losses on the enemy if you attack in a particular way. Thus, the real skill is in surrounding enemy units and eliminating them. Now, this is not as simple as it sounds and does take a reasonable amount of analytical thought, but that's what the game system is trying to get players to focus on. Let's look at this example. The dark units are attacking the white units, and this shows a possible attack combination. I personally do not agree with this particular combination, but it's not really a foolish attack, so I don't entirely disagree. As you'll see here, um, like on the extreme left, the two fours are attacking the single white five. Now, one, you know, that's just what the attacker has decided, and it achieves a two to one odds. Now, the attacker could decide to attack the three five with a single four four, thus allowing the remaining four four to attack in combination with some other unit, the artillery four three. You can start choosing and. Then, depending on how you actually conduct the combats and get retreats and advances, you can surround units and eliminate it. Let's take a look at an example. Okay, here what we see are two units achieving a 3 to 1 against the enemy cavalry unit, which happens to be a 3 5. This has a high chance of success, and that unit, the 3 5, will almost certainly retreat, allowing one of your two units to advance after combat. In this case, the phasing player decides to advance the 7-4 after combat into the spot that was previously occupied by the enemy 3-5 cavalry. This surrounds the 2-4, the enemy 2-4 unit, next to it. During the white player's combat phase, the 2-4 will be in a very difficult position and will be probably be forced to attack and lose, resulting it in being forced to retreat, which it can't retreat, and thus being eliminated. Now the reason why I don't particularly like the attack as described here is that uh, it does allow the white player a chance to save the 2-4, you know, let's say this additional artillery to the rear. What I would actually do is I'd attack the 3-5 with the single 7-4, achieving a 2-1 to one odds. Now this, on average, should cause the white unit to retreat. I think there's a 1 in 6 chance where it will not you just simply accept this lot chance, and anyway, as as the gambler should always remember, always go go with the odds. And uh, fighting out uh, these sort of battles is very much a gamble. So you know, a good commander always goes with the odds. They generally always achieve uh, success if they follow the odds. Anyway, that's my theory. Now, in the same combat phase, which means the white player does not have the ability to react. I would then attack the 2-4 with the 3 units, which achieves a 3-1. to one. Now that would absolutely, um, almost certainly cause it to retreat. It cannot retreat because the only two um, hexes that it has available has enemy zones of control in it. So it's eliminated. 
Now, the game does have, the game system does have complexity, and it's this what is the complexity. But it's the complexity of what to do and in what order. It's basically good complexity rather than just complex rules, difficult calculations, and complex die roll sequences, which are what I consider bad complexity. Now you may need to ask is how would you achieve the same in a figure gaming version? In this case we have three units in combat with three opposing units on the left. In this case the phasing player, white units, matches up one unit against his opponent unit. Note the phasing player could attack two units with one and attack the remaining with two units, but for simplicity it's basically each of those three units uh, will be attacking the three units above, A, B and C, uh, one at a time. Now, in A, the dark unit has won, resulting in it advancing after combat one base width. You can see this on the right. Attack B, the white unit has won. It advances after combat one base width. You can see this also on the right. And C, the dark unit has won, but the white unit has decided to take a loss instead of retreating. So you can see that on the left. This has resulted in a bit of confusion in, for the following combat phases. As attacking from a flank results in the unit strength being halved, again, this is one of the rules that I've added. You don't need to do this if you so desire. You can copy the board game. The opposing player, that is the dark units, will be forced into attacking each opposing unit with one of its units. Fair enough. Now, and that's probably what they would absolutely do. Now, you can see there is a big risk for the white player. If the unit in the center is unable to... if, if in B, the dark unit attacks that unit in the center and the white unit is unable to retreat, is forced to retreat, it will be eliminated. And that's because um, I have the concept of what's called movement zone control. That is, half a base in all direction is called a movement zone control. You cannot move through an enemy movement zone of control in the same way you can't move through a zone of control in a board game. You achieve pretty much the same as the board game. Now, in the previous example, the units are rather close together. Um, you don't need to have this situation occurring. You can actually have gaps in between units and achieve the same thing as the board game. We've basically duplicated hex space zones of control without the use of any hexes and achieved the same effect as the hex space system, all through the concept of units having what's called a movement zone of control, which extends half a base in all directions. As soon as an opposing unit touches a movement zone of control, its movement is locked. It's locked in position. So it's the same effect as the locked zone of control. And then once you're the phasing player, that is you have to attack, you also at that moment have a combat zone of control, which means you basically now have to attack all the enemy units within a combat zone of control. Combat zone of control happens to be a full base. So in this case, if the white unit was the phasing unit and it had to attack, because there are three units, it would have to attack all three units in its combat zone of control. It's not in a good position. On the other hand, the opposing unit, the dark unit, if it was the phasing player, it would only need to attack the, um, it would only need, it could only attack with one unit um, because the two units on the left and right flank weren't actually in a movement zone of control and didn't have a combat zone of control. Look, our players can play around with the details, but I find that particular system works quite well to eliminate the use of hexes. If you want hexes, you don't need to use this, just use the board gaming rules. Okay, how do we achieve a victory? As with pretty much all board games, there is a fixed number of game turns, which when the last game turn is reached, both sides calculate victory points and determine victory. Because we are simulating an entire battle at scales of one to two hours per game turns, the number of game turns will range from, let's say, six to 12 in spring and autumn per day. And multi-day multi battles would uh, normally be divided by days anyway. So when you had a situation like Leipzig, you would either play day one, two, or the last day. It's entirely up to you. If you wanted to play all three, Again, uh, that would be a much longer game. So basically, in terms of victory, this game system and rules and scenarios gives you a very clear victor at the end of the game, which is not an excessively long game. Now we come to the rules layer, which tends to be something that most uh, people ignore when they analyze rules. 
And I actually consider rules layout as being incredibly important in terms of learning a set of rules. Now, rules layout have no effect if someone's teaching you the rules. They teach you the rules, uh, no matter how bad the rules layout is, if you've seen a game being played, you know certain things are possible. It's all about just marking out where those critical rules are. But if you're trying to learn the rules based on nothing more than the rules, the rules layout becomes critical. And if you're playing a game and you need to cross-reference special rules, then the layout is also very critical. Now, in terms of layout, this game system rules are excellent. These are very short rules. The standard rules for Marengo spans four pages. I agree, it's small print and three column, but the rules are only four pages in length, which is incredibly good. There are exclusive rules, which only include a few special rules. Someone could easily learn the rules in a few hours and could learn the rules quicker if playing a game against someone who actually knew the rules. Um, I would have to rate the rules layout and the ability to learn how to play the games from the rules as incredibly high, much higher than most figure gaming rules. One thing that tends to be uh, ignored in most figure gaming rules is cross-referencing. Cross-referencing is important because when you're playing a game and you say, well, wait a minute, what do I do in this particular situation? Uh, you may remember some rules and go to the rule book, but it may not be what you're looking at. But if the rules are adequately cross-referenced, you can see, please see case 7.7. .7. You could go there and find the rule that you're attempting to cross-reference. Cross-referencing is incredibly important. And it really is something that tends to be ignored by most figure gaming rule designers. Now, special rules, which I must admit normally uh, are a negative in terms of game designs, uh, are present in this game system. However, for each scenario, uh, there's only normally about one or two per battle. So it's not really a big thing. So what we see here are all the special rules for one of the battles. Now, if you increase the complexity of the base game system, you could remove all these special rules and embed them into the standard rules. But, um, you know, there would not be much of a net gain if the special rules, let's say, only apply to one particular battle. So I think the way that they've done things here is, is actually quite good. As for markers and counters, which possibly could clutter up a playing area, there are none which is a big plus in terms of maximizing bling. The only real record keeping is off the playing area and it's really the game turn record chart and possibly the demoralization chart if you're using that optional rule. Now the rules do require you to have the ability to divide and multiply um, so you can determine odds. This is not really a major issue and it's not a massively extreme amount of calculation but it's something that you need to consider. As, the die roll, um, as for die rolling, it's a single die roll per combat, so there's absolutely no issue if you don't like the massive die roll um, type game systems. I don't particularly mind the massive die roll game systems, but um, there is only a very small number of die rolls. You just need to do a little bit of calculation. Another important aspect for figure gaming rules is supporting materials such as army lists, game aids and scenarios. However, for a board game, that's not as important as for figure gaming. The SPI board games have everything you need to play a game or battle, and as indicated, there are 14 battles to choose from. But apart from this, there are no additional supporting material required and available. For the figure gaming version of the SPI board games, while the board game rules have been copied as closely as possible, a few necessary changes were required in order to convert them into a figure gaming format. The first was the units. In the board game, each unit had a frontage of 1 hex, or 400 metres on average, and a strength which ranged from 1 to 8 strength points. Some games went as high as 12 strength points, but that was rather exceptional. The easiest way of duplicating the unit would be to assemble each strength point or assume each strength point represents one element. This would require a unit to be a collection of elements which would be too wide and up to 4D. This would allow you to quickly identify the strength of a unit by viewing the number of elements in it. This would require a hex to have a width of 8 centimetres, which would require a scale of 1 5000 to duplicate the typical playing area, which requires in turn a playing area of 6 by 8 feet. 
This is the preferred optimal side and gives you the closest game to the original board game. For practical reasons, I use a scale of one element equals two strength points, which allows me to have a smaller playing areas. In this case, my units consist of only one element wide and up to four deep maximum. We now need to consider movement, or exactly what does a movement point represent in a figure game. In the board game, this allows you to enter one clear hex. So if the unit was eight centimeters wide, then one movement point which previously allowed you to enter one hex, now would allow you to move eight centimeters in the same terrain. Most of the other uh, modifications are fairly minimal and simple to implement. The biggest issue is zone of controls, which would normally require the use of hexes. I went down the hex less path, which requires me to have a more complex zone of control rule to duplicate the hex based zone of control rule. The method I use is the concept of a movement zone control, which is half a base width in all directions from a unit. As soon as you move into a movement zone control of your enemy, your movement, your movement immediately stops and you can't exit the movement zone control. This provides you with the movement effects of zone controls, or the locked movement effects. Once a unit is in an enemy zone control, it possesses a combat zone control during its phasing combat phase. A combat zone of control is a full base width in all directions, or if it's a 4 cm wide base, 4 cm in all directions. Phasing units must attack all enemy units in a combat zone of control, and all enemy, all units in a enemy zone of control, that is an enemy movement zone of control, must attack in turn, which reproduces the compulsory combat effect of zones of control. Look, in conclusion, the board game rules were very popular, they're very good, and continue to be played today. They have to be considered possibly one of the most successful game systems and series of games that SPI ever published. The rules themselves are very chess-like. It's all about players carefully moving units into certain positions and carefully scheduling their attacks in order to achieve their objectives. The objective may not be achieved in a single phase in combat phase, but could be designed to put the enemy player in an impossible position during its phase in combat phase. Each player has to think ahead, but what needs to be thought out is not basically understanding charts, tables and calculations. It's the command type decisions that need to be made. This is actually very good and possibly one reason why the game system has been so successful. Now, the downside is the rules lack flavour. There is little bing. Now, in a board game environment, no problems, but, but in a figure gaming area, it's a big issue. Now, using figures does assist a great deal, but it's still comparatively bing-less. On the other hand, you get a game, which is easy to learn and play, quick and gets you a result. Bling can be added, but of course, this always needs to be weighed up against playability, because adding bling means that you're going to reduce playability but it's certainly an option that players can consider. At this point in my video, I normally come up with a list of comparative games. However, it's a bit difficult because I'm reviewing a board game and uh, there aren't really many figure games which are really very close, or figure game rules which are close to a board game. Nonetheless, I can look at the general over, over, overview of what the board game attempts to achieve, which is basically historically depicting a battle. Now, Age of Eagles is a set of figure gaming rules that really is heavily focused on reproducing uh, historical battles, so it's pretty close to it. And of course, uh, bloody big Napoleonic battles would also fit into that group, but they're about the only two sets of rules which uh, sort of fit in that group. Blucher, for example, which in theory can duplicate, let's say, Waterloo, it does it in a very abstract way, um, so I wouldn't compare it with, let's say, a board game. And of course, rules such as DBN, even though they claim to be able to reproduce, let's say, Waterloo, they're not really designed as being a set of rules which allow you to duplicate a historical battle. They're, it's more of a, more of a chess-like type game. Very good, very enjoyable, but that's where it fits. It's not really similar to, let's say, Age of Eagles or bloody big Napoleonic battles. Anyway, they're about the closest to figure gaming rules. If you want to... Um, duplicate a historical battle, that's the direction that I would particularly move down. 
This ends my video, part 38, on the figure gaming version of the SPI Napoleonics Folio board games, a rather unusual review, but nonetheless I've found converting board games into figure gamings to be surprisingly effective in terms of giving me a game which, um, let's say, most figure gaming rules do not normally provide me with, in a format that allows me to play a game fairly quickly. Denken Sie daran, immer für Hilfe, Herr Matlin, zu kämpfen.